Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about poverty with Karen Dolan, who is Project Director of the Criminalization of Race and Poverty Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Karen has been on before, but it has been a long time. Karen Dolan, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David. Good to see you. Great to see you. Um, There are new numbers out, I take it, about poverty. Yes, every year in September, the U.S. Census Bureau releases data on poverty, income, and health coverage um, from the previous year. So September this year, the U.S. Census Bureau released that data for the year of 2023. And it says what? Well, what the, the overall takeaway from it is it shows that we have disinvested in American families and children, which has been true more or less for a long time in modern in modern times over the last couple of decades, ex- with the notable exception of the response to the COVID pandemic. So in 2021, when COVID hit, you know, we had a global crisis, a national crisis, people were losing their jobs, rents were skyrocketing, supply chains were disrupted, people couldn't afford to live, the food insecurity was spiking, people were ill, they were dying. And the government did step in to do the right thing, something we should always have been doing, uh, which was to provide robust investments in our children and family. So for instance, we helped, people were helped with uh, rental assistance as rental prices spiked, which they continue to spike today. Uh, There was an eviction moratorium, there was help with unemployment insurance, Uh, there was help with home heating and cooling, Food, extra food assistance for children, summer meal programs. When, when, when school was out, they reduced some of the bureaucracy around Medicaid so that people didn't have to keep applying. Uh, that helped to keep people insured, kept them on the Medicaid rolls. Uh, and most importantly, or at least among one of the most important policies from a poverty perspective, was an increase and in expansion and eligibility for the child tax credit. Also the earned income tax credit, which is another very important tax credit that goes to low income workers who don't have children. But for those people that do have children, qualifying children, uh, the the number of the amount of money that families were able to receive per eligible child was not only increased, but it was made available, the first half of it was made available monthly. Before that, it would just come at tax time, it would come in your tax return, uh, which, you know, which would help a lot of people if they they had to get a new car or a new refrigerator or something. But really what we've learned from the data is that people need that money monthly so they can pay their rent, so they can put the food on the table, so that they can pay the education expenses for their children childcare, et cetera. So that made such a big difference that we saw in 2021, child poverty was reduced to a historic low of just over 5%. Now, your listeners might recall there was a lot of talk after the pandemic program started to expire of renewing these in the form of a bill called Build Back Better. So the idea of that was, you know, we had suffered so much during the pandemic. And at the same time, we had learned so much as to how to respond so that workers can stay employed, so that children can be fed, so that uh, parents are able to keep a, a, a roof over their families. Uh, heads. So the Build Back Better bill would have learned, would have taken these lessons we learned, and would have extended 
these programs that had worked so well. But there was no conservative support, either on the Republican side or two members of conservative Republicans. So, uh, I'm sorry, two, member, two members of the Democratic Party who were conservative, Cinema uh, and Manchin. Yeah. And so because of that, these programs were allowed to expire, or I should say more actively, they were caused to expire, despite the fact that we knew how beneficial they were. So by 2021, by 2022, when the census came out with their uh, their data, and also what we could see from short-term uh, reports immediately after the ex expiration of the expanded child tax credit was childhood poverty spiked. And in 2022, it went from 5.2%, the historic low of 2021, up to 12.4% in 2022. And then this year for 2023 numbers, it went up to 13.7%. So you can see that when, as soon as we stopped the kind of investment that American families and children need and deserve, as we all do as a human right, as soon as that is taken away, poverty goes through the roof again. And do they still use as a measure of poverty this antiquated, you know, system where food is a huge chunk of your expenses and rents that have gone through the roof don't exist and childcare and transportation don't exist and so forth? I mean, it, are there more kids who are actually poor than what those numbers look like? Well, you bring up a good point. So the numbers I'm using and that most people use are are not that. So that's the official poverty measure, which, as you point out, doesn't really effectively measure poverty because it's based on a 50-year-old basket of goods that hasn't been adjusted. What the numbers that I just spoke to you about are weighted numbers by the supplemental poverty measure, which actually take into account um, the old way or the official way, I think the O should stand for old instead of official, uh, was just your pre-tax cash income and that's it. So the supplemental poverty measure takes into account the benefits that people get from child tax credit from food stamps, which is called SNAP now, um, these different assistances. And then it also takes into account geography, cost of living in different parts of the country, and it also takes into account necessary expenses that families have to pay for work, for education. So it's a much more comprehensive measure. So when I'm going to be talking to you about these numbers, I'm using the, the supplemental poverty measure, FPM, and most people use that. The OPM, the official poverty measure, the old poverty measure, is rarely used because it's so inadequate. So these are pretty good numbers and child poverty has doubled or tripled as a result of not sticking with successful programs? It's more than doubled. And, and the uh, Columbia University has a center on poverty and social policy. And right after these census numbers came out, they crunched the numbers and they showed that if the expanded child tax credit from 2021, if just that program, remember there were lots of other programs that I was telling you about, extra food, housing, health, energy, that sort of thing. But if just the expanded child tax credit had been in place in 2023, instead of the number being 13.7% of children in poverty, with just that one program, it would have been 8.6. And then when you add in all of the other programs, you know, you get back down closer to the 5%. Even 5% is too high in the wealthiest nation in the world. So it's not that that's a panacea, but we have learned that what we need to be doing is investing in our families. So the child tax credit, for instance, costs about $97 billion a year. But there is a return tenfold. So for every dollar invested in the child, the expanded child tax credit or in the, ch the child tax credit itself, because one still exists, it's just smaller and available to fewer people. The return is $10 for every dollar 
invested. So you invest 97 billion per year, but you get back 1 trillion in social benefit. And the way that works is parents can go to work. Children are healthier. Families are healthier. Long-term when children experience poverty, they have long-term health impacts, negative health impacts, long-term negative mental health impacts, long-term negative educational attainment, long-term negative employment and earning uh, outcomes. The opposite is true, of course, when you lift children out of poverty. So when children are not in poverty, their long-term, every metric by which we measure well-being in, increases dramatically. And that redounds to society. So it also, you know, by any metric, uh, whether you're looking at child poverty, food, you know, um, housing, um, you know, the, the way we're able to stay healthy, health insurance, earnings, wages, household income, the more we reduce income inequality, earnings inequality, wealth inequality, that it produces higher GDP, um, it reduces poverty. I mean, there's just, there's no sense in not doing this, but we are not doing that. So what we're doing instead is the giant tax cuts for the uber wealthy and the highest paying corporation. And as you know, the Pentagon budget. So both parties think nothing of spending a trillion dollars on the Pentagon budget. Well, that doesn't redound to society. That increases the profits of the defense industry in every state in the country that are paying for this through the, the representatives from those, from those regions. So you can see how skewed our national priorities are. I could not agree more. We're speaking with Karen Dolan, who's project director of the Criminalization of Race and Poverty Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, Karen, I always quibble with the wealthiest nation on earth thing because it's always said for a good cause, but it isn't true. I mean, per capita, there are always several nations that are wealthier than the United States, but it does seem to be the nation that does the worst with what it's got. Uh, I mean, do other nation, wealthy nations have this rate of poverty and child poverty? And have they abandoned programs that were working during COVID in the same way as the United States? Well, that's a great question. And the United States goes up and down in terms of being but, you know, a few years ago it was, it might be, I don't know what it is now. But. In giant pile of wealth, it's between the U.S. and China. It depends how you measure it. But in per capita wealth, it's right. not. It's it not. depends on how you measure it. That's right. But if what, So let's say we're talking about all industrialized nations or what we consider to be wealthy nations. We are at the bottom in terms of how we invest in children and families. So most places, have, most other industrialized nations have a child allowance. They don't have to quibble over this child tax credit. So the way the child tax credit works right now is the poorest people for whom the credit exceeds their tax burden, they don't get that money. During the pandemic, it was fully refundable. That means you're not, you're not dependent on um, your income meeting the the amount of the credit. You receive it because you need it the most. Yeah. So it's very perverse that we don't have that. Other industrialized countries simply have a child allowance. That's what we need here. A child allowance that is not um, tied to, do you make enough money in order to um, receive the benefit to take care of your children? Children need to be taken care of whether they are destitute or not. The argument, of course, should be the more need there is, the more help uh, is given. So it seems fairly clear some of the things that should be done. Uh, is it clear to people in Washington, D.C.? And is anybody going to do it? And how can we make them do it? Well, I think it's clear, um, you know, at least for now, I don't want to be partisan, but I do have to look at the, the truth of what ideology is supporting investment in families and children and what 
uh, ideology is instead supporting only the uber wealthy. And right now that seems to um, come down on party line. Uh, but as, as I've noted before, and, and as you know, there are also conservative Democrats uh, who privilege pharmaceutical companies, who privilege corporations, who privilege certainly the defense industry. Um, so it's not always exactly on party lines. But, but in general, the more, you know, the more that we're true to the idea of the U.S. as a liberal democracy, meaning we have the idea that people should be equal. We should have equal opportunity. We should thrive equally. The color of our skin, our gender, our zip code shouldn't make us less than somebody else simply with that baked into the, into the economic system. But that is what we have. And that is that, that, that rigged system is further entrenched when you have whenever you have a majority whose conservative ideology is the debunked theory of trickle-down economics. So we've been trying trickle-down economics for 50 years. It has never worked. The, the evidence is to the contrary. The only thing that trickle-down economics does is provide more yachts for people at the top and simply anchors for the rest of us. So that is a debunked theory, and that is one that conservative lawmakers use as justification for starving social investments and giving all of the money to the most wealthy. So as long, whenever we have a majority that, that um, in my opinion, disingenuously spouts this debunked trickle down economic theory that inequality is going to increase. And that is bad for all of us. I saw Karen Dolan that the state of Massachusetts had put in place this year a tax on multi-million dollar incomes that has brought in this year vast amounts of money, vastly more than the federal government has brought in through its reforms at the IRS, closing loopholes and so forth. And you have NFL football players whining that they won't get players to come to the New England Patriots because they'll have to pay this tax. Wouldn't the solution be to get the other states to do the same thing? I mean, you have this super successful policy. What are the chances of, you know, getting the other states to do it? Isn't this the solution to the inequality to tax the mega wealthy? It is. I mean, and that's one of the problems is that we are lose. We have no revenue. Um, and you only get revenue from taxation. And those who are paying the least taxes and in many cases, zero taxes are the most wealthy in the corporate. However, yes, it's wonderful if states do it, but that means again you're going to have more inequality based on your zip code in which state you live in because conservative states will not do it so it must be done at the federal level this has to be a, has to be a federal policy that's not to say that individual states shouldn't do it they should i mean individual states are also expanding the child tax credit or the earned income tax credit or you know have certain are some states are more generous than others that also um you know, that also in, increases our overall um, inequality and it kind of dooms um, people who are stuck in the state. For instance, there's 12 states that chose to reject federal money for the expansion of Medicaid. So you have over 2 million people who are stuck in this Medicaid coverage gap where they can't get health insurance simply because their state lawmakers said, no, we don't want you to have that. We are, we're not going to take federal money. Well, I mean, we'll take federal money for rich people and for corporations and for the defense industry and the gun industry. Well, I mean, we'll take whatever money we can get for us, but we won't take any money for you. Uh, so that's, you know, that, that is a, um, that's a real problem. <laughs> Obviously, that's a real problem. And so that's reflected in the poverty numbers. At the same time, we should also recognize that the reason poverty is lower now than it was, you know, uh, 60 years ago is because of 
programs like uh, low-income housing tax credits, like Medicare and Medicaid, like SNAP, even you know, SNAP has been is very is a is a very uh, smart economic program because, like the child tax credit, it it, it generates more wealth. Um, our cash assistance to to poor people, which used to be called welfare, um, is now temporary assistance for needy families. is so small it barely makes a difference. And then again, that is controlled by the state. So that we saw, I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago. Um, I think it was in Louisiana, you know, the, these famous sports people were taking TANF money for a sports stadium mm -hmm. yeah. because it was block granted to the states. And so the states allowed them to do that. Um, so as long as we have states that are going to continue to squeeze families and children, these policies have to be at the federal level to ensure, you know, to, a, to ensure equality. The, uh, another thing uh, that varies wildly by state is minimum wage now, and I think we're, correct me if I'm wrong, we're still at the record length of time and growing that the federal government has done nothing to correct the, the minimum wage shrinking with the cost of living. Um, yeah, I, that's a huge problem. So, you know, anybody knows that you cannot survive on 725 an hour. So, yes, a lot of states have raised the minimum wage but then if you're stuck in a state that hasn't or you're in a state that has a higher minimum wage but yet the market rate for a rental unit is higher than what you can make i mean currently there is no place in the country where a family can afford a modest market rate two-bedroom apartment on, on a minimum wage regardless of what that minimum wage is in that geographical location yeah. so that's a huge problem but yes this is another instance if people were paid a living wage we wouldn't have the same need for assist assistance programs we wouldn't have to give we wouldn't have to provide summer meals for children if their families were making a living wage i mean these these things are common sense we know what to do and in response to the pandemic, we we went a long way toward that. We didn't go as far as we needed to go, but we went a long way. And the Build Back Better bill proposal would have gone even farther. But we do not have a government that is representative of its constituents. We have a majority, or at least a majority in whenever you have in one of either two houses, that is representing only the interests of the wealthy and the corporate, then you cannot get representation for the rest of us. Yeah. Karen Dolan, we've got about five minutes left. I, I was amused, I think, in a different way from everybody else when Donald Trump could only come up with concepts of a plan for what might be better than Obamacare, because I was thinking, hasn't every other wealthy nation on earth come up with something dramatically better? I mean, nobody even talks about creating a, a single payer universal health coverage system and getting rid of all the healthcare disasters in this country the way pretty much every other wealthy country has done. Is, is that, would that not make a huge difference? And isn't it, hasn't it sort of been eliminated even from the conversation? It would make an enormous difference. So health costs are one of the top top causations of poverty and death and unnecessary death. Um, one thing I'll note that that came out in the poverty numbers is that the the pandemic one pandemic program was actually extended by the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, passed by the Biden administration that extended the Affordable Care Act premium tax credit. So that enabled millions of more people, primarily Black and Latinx. So it really, really helped with the, with the racial gap that, that is persistent in every earning, household wealth, uh, you know, poverty rate, unemployment, health, all that, the racial and the gender gaps are still unforgivably high. But the premium tax credits for the ACA um, really helped to reduce that. Those come up 
to, to expire um, in uh, in 2025, and we'll be part of the fight because 2025 will be the year of taxes. Yes, we wouldn't need any of that if we had a single payer um, health plan. So you could see the you could see the the the, the trajectory of you know, sort of a liberal um, economic outlook, not neoliberal, I'm not talking about foreign policy, I'm just talking about the equality of a liberal democracy of the Biden administration, and even the Harris campaign trying to move in that way with regard to lowering prescription drug costs, having Medicaid uh, negotiating drug, drug costs, providing subsidies for people to afford health care. Politically, that seems as far as they can go. If there were, you know, a trifecta of liberal, liberal Democrats with a small d, let's pretend that there were Republicans who were able to think with a, the mindset of a liberal democracy and equality for all. But if we had a, a majority of that in the House, Senate, and the White House, um, then we probably could get a single payer health. Plan. And that would make an enormous difference. It would be wonderful. We got about one minute left. Karen Dolan, what should everybody do? How can they follow your work and get in touch with you and so forth? Well, our website is ips-dc.org. My Twitter is my own personal uh, views only, and that's at Karen Dolan. I think it's the same on threads, at Karen Dolan. Uh, we have lots of material on, on our uh, website, and without being partisan for whomever you believe in, get out and vote. Don't, don't let your voice go unheard, no matter who it is you're voting for. Karen Dolan is Project Director of the Criminalization of Race and Poverty Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Karen, thank you for everything you keep doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks so much for having me, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.